Olá, gente. Podemos recomeçar a nossa sessão. É, primeiro, só assim, acabamos de ter de, o Paulo Artache de volta. Ele acabou de chegar da escola. Né, conforme eu anunciei ontem, mencionei, né, a gente esse ano está buscando essa parceria, e eu estava, estávamos agora ouvindo o relato do Paulo, e eu estou aqui só falando isso, porque no ano que vem, se a Helena topar, da gente estender né, essa oportunidade de vários de nós irmos às escolas do entorno, enquanto a gente está aqui, e o Paulo agora está emocionado né, do que ele viu e presenciou nessa escola, e eu já quero convidar todo mundo para o ano que vem, se vocês tiverem assim, a disponibilidade né, de passar uma hora e meia numa escola aqui do entorno, nessa região, que tem muitas... Né, assim, as fotos são exatamente essas que a gente viu na última sessão. Vai ser muito legal. Então, muito obrigada, Paulo. Eu acho que, em nome da academia, a gente pode agradecer a sua disponibilidade. Bem, é, eu estou aqui, então, para apresentar né, o nosso ilustre e querido convidado, né, que vem falar para a gente sobre, afinal, o que é o antropoceno. Né? Eu acho que o que nos reúne aqui é né, falar um pouco da ciência básica para o desenvolvimento sustentável e definir o que é o antropoceno, quais são os impactos né, que nós estamos imprimindo é, sobre o nosso planeta, é, nos pareceu fundamental. E a sugestão do nome do professor Collins veio do Marcelo. E o Marcelo me fez, né, falou, olha, ele é uma pessoa fantástica, lê esse artigo dele, eu li o artigo que ele publicou na Science em 2000, e 15, e eu recomendo esse, esse texto, porque é, é muito claro, é de fácil compreensão, ele é um geólogo, geofísico, e o que está escrito ali, eu acho que todos nós, né, enquanto seres humanos, precisamos ler o que está ali. Bem, então, só para... Espera aí que acabou de sair agora, apareceu a, a foto do meu neto, <risos> que é a foto do meu celular, que é, que é uma coisa mais linda do mundo. Mas, enfim, de, depois da Catarina, <risos> né, Helena? Mas, enfim. Bom, o Dr. Colin Waters, ele é da Universidade de La Leicester, na, na, no Reino Unido, né, na, na Inglaterra. Ele é professor da Escola de Geografia, Geologia e Meio Ambiente da Universidade de Leicester, na Inglaterra, conforme eu falei. E, muito importante, ele lidera o grupo de trabalho sobre antropoceno. E nós estávamos conversando há pouco com ele. Eles estão próximos, né, Marcelo, de anunciar para toda a comunidade do planeta, o resultado né, desse trabalho, desse grupo, e eu acho que vai ser realmente um, um marco né, quando esse anúncio for, for feito né, do, desse grupo de trabalho, que desenvolve pesquisas e, e a própria caracterização do, do antropoceno como um período geológico. A sua área principal de pesquisa é justamente a estratigrafia do carbonífero e do antropoceno, mapeando quantidade... É, mapeando, quantificando e identificando os marcadores né, para depósitos de sedimentos provenientes da atividade humana. Então, conforme vocês vão ver, esse é um período né, que começou basicamente há 70 anos atrás, né, depois da Segunda Guerra, e ele vai explicar para a gente quais são esses marcadores que nós estamos, os nossos rastros né, que estão ficando nesse planeta. Então, thank you very much for coming. It's really a great Pleasure for all of us to have you here with us. Please come in. So, thank you, Deborah, for those words, and and thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you today. Uh, it's a it's a great honor for me to be here, um, introducing the work of the Anthropocene Working Group, uh, which is a body that was established in 2009. Um, we're very close to coming up to our official decision in the next few months. Um, but I just want to acknowledge that the group comprises 35 uh, academics, uh, very senior academics, who, uh, without their contribution, none of this presentation would be possible. So, the Anthropocene Working Group, its main purpose is to provide a formal definition of what the Anthropocene represents as a geological time unit. And to put that in context, the geological time scale 
is how we geologists deal with the enormity of time. So we've got 4.6 billion years of planetary history. How do we cope with trying to understand such huge scope of time? What we do is subdivide the geology into a number of units. And it's a hierarchical scheme. So we should see here that uh, on the left-hand side, we have the larger units, known as eras, which are then comprised of periods, then of epochs. And what is not shown here is that we also have ages, the smaller scale that we have uh, as part of our way of breaking up the geology of the planet. Treat these as being almost dynastic changes to planetary history. Uh, probably the biggest examples that you can possibly see are these, shown in red here, the mass extinction events. So this is when we had more than 75% of all species became extinct. Uh, the, the famous one, perhaps, is, is the end of the Mesozoic. And that's when we see the end of the, the loss of the, the non-avian dinosaurs. That major change to the planet, and it's the fifth in the last half a billion years that we've had these mass extinction events. But this one caused such a change to the, the biology of the planet that we refer to the era then the Cenozoic, and Cenozoic in Greek is new life. And so it's this new life form that have evolved post the end of the Mesozoic. Now, the Cenozoic comprises periods and epochs. And importantly here is to realize that all epochs of the Cenozoic have this suffix, sen, C-E-N-E. -E. So sen, Cenozoic, they relate. Um, so whenever you hear the term Anthropocene, which is shown here, then realize that that's representing a human epoch of time. That's the scale we're talking about. And that gives you an impression of the magnitude. It's bigger than an age, but it's smaller than a period or an era. So, what I'll do now is just focus into the Quaternary, which is the sort of more recent part. It's the last 2.6 million years. It's the time where the planet had evolved into ice sheets present both at the North and South Poles. And as I mentioned here, so the other period is the Quaternary. It comprises formerly of only two epochs, the Pleistocene and the Holocene. The Pleistocene is 99.5% of the whole duration of the Quaternary. And the Pleistocene is a time where we have cyclical fluctuations between periods of very cold uh, glacial conditions and then intervening much warmer interglacials. There's about 50 interglacials and 50 glacials during this interval of time. The last of these warmer periods, the interglacials, has been specifically uh, attributed as an epoch in its own right, and that's the Holocene. Uh, it starts at about 11,700 years, which represents the end of the last ice age. Uh, it itself is comprising a series of stages, and the stages are defined uh, at these ages, which represent small duration climatic changes uh, that happened 8,200 uh, 8, years ago and 4,200 years ago. And so we can see that we have this small subdivision of the Holocene into these component stages. Um, important to realize the only reason why the Holocene is picked out as being special is it's a time where human civilization evolved across the planet. In a series of locations across the planet, we have starting to see the generation of urbanization, um, uh, pastoralism, agriculture developing and spreading around the planet. So uh, that's why the Holocene is significant. But it's also important to realize that it's also a period of relative stability. So it's a, it's a warm climatic environment in which human civilization can prosper. In effect, humans were responding to the climate rather than causing climatic change. And that's a big difference to what we're talking about here, which is our proposal is to have an Anthropocene uh, which follows on from the Holocene. So we're saying the Holocene is now terminated, it's finished. We have a new epoch of time called the Anthropocene. And we're saying it starts as, as recently as the middle of the 20th century. This is quite difficult for many geologists to, to comprehend because we're used to dealing with rocks which are millions of years old. So to start talking about an epoch, which is only 70 years, the, the average lifespan of a person um, is difficult for people to grasp. 
Uh, but I'm going to show you in this presentation the evidence of why we think it starts in the mid-20th century. So, presentation is going to be, first of all, let's introduce the origins of the term Anthropocene, what we mean by it. Much of the presentation is going to be looking at this key evidence of why the mid-20th century is that focal point of change. I'll then briefly just mention towards the end uh, the processes by which we're going to try and provide a definition for the Anthropocene and why this announcement we're going to make in the next month or so is of significance. And then lastly, just as a, a couple of slides, what's the future of the Anthropocene? You know, geologists always deal with the historical past, but can we say something what's going to happen about the Anthropocene into the future? So the origin of the term is thanks to this great man, uh, Paul Crutzen, who's a, a Nobel laureate, atmospheric chemist. He was at a, a conference, which was the International Geosphere Biosphere Program in Mexico in 2000. And he kept hearing people saying, we're living in the Holocene. And he got so frustrated by this, he stood up and said, no, we're not. We're living in the Anthropocene. And that, that raised lots of discussion amongst the audience who have said to him, perhaps you should write that down as a, a publication. Explain what you mean by this term. So which he did uh, in his publication in the IGPP newsletter in the same year, 2000. Uh, though he's not a geologist, he did understand geology sufficiently to know that if you use the word Anthropocene, you're talking about an epoch of geological time. And it's quite clear that he is talking about the Anthropocene as a geological time unit. He says, it seems appropriate to assign the term Anthropocene to the present, in many ways, human-dominated geological epoch, supplementing the Holocene, the warm period of the last 10 to 12 millennia. If I have a slight problem about this publication, is the title, Geology of Mankind. And you also see quite often in the media uh, things like the age of humans. Well, to me, you know, humans have had an impact on the planet for, what, 300,000 years? Um, if anything, the age of humans is the Holocene. So really, what Paul's talking about is very different to that. He's talking about a very significant change that humans have caused in the very recent past to completely modify the planetary system. So, there is, there is a, several publications that have come out recently which are contradictory to Paul Crutzen's vision and the working group's vision of what the Anthropocene represents. And this is perhaps the extreme version, uh, which is a publication that came out last year. Uh, lead off was Phil Gibbard et al. And it introduces this term, the Anthropocene event. And, and the title is a misnomer in two respects. First of all, as we've said already, the scene here tells you we're talking about an epoch of geological time, and yet they're recognizing an epoch, they're recognizing a, an event shown by this uh, green triangle, which cuts across time. So it's not, it's not an epoch at all. And it also calls it an event. And events in geology, as in the English language, mean short duration intervals of time. But they're using this as an idea of gradual change over at least 55,000 years of increasing human impact on the planet. And they show that by having this triangle which grow, it goes with an even slope getting increasing towards present day and shows a gradation in, in uh, green color suggesting increasing impact as you go in this direction. But it's an even slope. What they're saying here is the changes happen very, very gradually and there's no sudden transition. And then similarly, these historical timelines here show gradations in color, which gives the impression that things are gradual, and also that many of the significant impacts of humans, these darker colors, come in at thousands of years, if not tens of thousands of years ago. What this figure does not do, and what they do not, as part of this concept do, is talk about what is actually one of humanity's biggest impacts on the planet, something known as the Great Acceleration. It's not mentioned here at all. So what is the Great Acceleration? It was introduced in this paper um, by Will Steffen, who sadly died earlier this year, Paul Crutzen himself as well, and also the historian John McNeil. Uh, all three of these authors subsequently became members of our working group. And in this paper, the Anthropocene, are humans now overwhelming the great forces of nature. They introduced the idea of the Great Acceleration. What they did 
was look at data. And they, they plotted information from 1800 through to the present day, uh, looking at a number of socio-economic trends. So to summarize, things like population, economic growth, energy use, urbanization, globalization, and the effects of the green agricultural revolution. Um, they then recognized that these social economic trends had significant impacts on Earth, system, Earth systems as well. So things like the, the changes in, in amounts of greenhouse gases, climate warming, changes to marine ecosystems, changes to the nitrogen and carbon cycle, and biosphere degradation are driven by these processes. And what they recognized was a significant, in fact, a phenomenal upturn in all of the data that they were looking at. And so most of my presentation is going to look at these components. But before I do that, I just want to pick out two of these trends, so population and energy use. Right, so we, we have here a, sort of an estimate of how many people lived on the planet. At the beginning of the Holocene, 11,000 years ago, about 2 million people. And there's this very slow, gradual increase in population until you get to the start of the Industrial Revolution where you start to see this upturn. That's here, 800 million people. But there's a, an even more significant upturn that happens here in 1950. Uh, and what you're finding then is population goes from 2.5 billion through to 8 billion today. So a tripling of population in uh, less than 70 years. This is the great acceleration curve as defined by Will Stefan et al. Then if you look at energy consumption, and uh, there's our global population trend here, we've just seen that, and notice how that energy consumption pretty much aligns parallel to the increasing population. But the important thing here is to realize that prior to about 1850, all energy consumption was essentially coming from biomass burning. During the Industrial Revolution, coal becomes increasingly more significant, but interestingly, appreciate that also coal continues uh, to increase in its importance. So coal is still, uh, still not just an Industrial Revolution energy source, it's very prominent still today. But the upturn we see, the great acceleration that happens in 1950, is driven by this sudden increase in the amount of combustion of oil and natural gas. And there's some phenomenal statistics about this. First of all, greater than 90% of all of the coal, oil and gas ever exploited has been burned since 1950. The energy used since 1950 is about 1.6 times greater than all previous human history. And to put this in context of natural processes, in 2021, anthropogenic uh, emissions of CO2 were about 36 billion tonnes. Compare that with volcanoes, which are a significant com contributor to um, CO2 naturally. All the volcanoes on the planet were yielding about 200 million tonnes a year. So it shows you to the extent to which humans are overwhelming natural processes. So now I'm going to talk about a number of the signals that uh, we recognize as being distinctive of the onset of the Anthropocene. We break them into five different components. So there's novel materials, so novel compounds, things like concrete, fly ash, plastics. There's a change flux to sediments, so it's changes to things like fluvial processes, but also the artificial deposits, the things that we create and deposit on the planet. Geochemical signals, and we can talk about things like uh, changes to the carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur cycles, uh, presence of heavy metals, organic comp compounds, and radiogenic fallout climatic signals, and then lastly, the biological signals. And we tend to break those into being related to extinctions of species, transfer of species around the planet, and also the development of domesticated species. Now, a lot of the information that's relevant to this was published in this paper in Science in 2016. Uh, you'll see the, these are, at the time, were the members of the Anthropocene Working Group who were involved in developing this, this concept. Um, a lot of the figures I'll be talking about in this presentation come from, from this uh, paper. So if you want a, a good summary of what the Anthropocene represents, then I recommend this. So let's start with novel materials. It's the sort of materials that you'll find deposited in 
things like this, this landfill site. Interesting to realize that over 4.6 billion years, the Earth has evolved about 5,000 minerals, so naturally occurring compounds. Humans have generated about 200,000 uh, artificial mineral-like compounds in only a century or so. So overwhelming the natural processes yet again. Let's take some examples. Um, the, the red curve is for aluminium, and the blue curve is for concrete. These are cumulative production figures. If you'd been alive in 1900, you probably would never have seen aluminium as a metal. And yet we're all familiar to Coca-Cola Coca cans, uh, aluminium foil, aeroplanes are now made of that metal. In fact, about 500 million tons of aluminium has been produced since 1950. Concrete, obviously the Romans initially developed concrete back uh, 2,000 years ago, but mineralogically it's very different to the concrete we produce today. And in fact, of the 500 billion tons of concrete we've produced, um, about half of that has been in the last 20 years. And if you were able to distribute that concrete around the planet evenly, it would be a, a kilogram block of concrete on every single square meter of the entire surface of the planet. So that's a sea and on land. So it's, it's a phenomenal amount of material that we've generated in a short period of time. Plastics. Certainly there were polymers that have been developed prior to 1950. So things like celluloid, rayon, bakelite, but produced in very small amounts. Most of the polymers that we're familiar with in the present day were invented around about 1950, and production figures for this annually have increased from about 1.7 million tons in 1950. We produced this figure in, in 2016, when it was 299 million tons per year of plastics. It's now actually more like 367 million tons. In that short period of time, it's increased that much. Putting it into context again, uh, the cumulative production of plastics is about 9 billion tons. Compare that with the biomass of the entire animal kingdom, which is 2.6 billion tons of carbon. Only about 10% of that plastic is recycled. Much of it goes to landfill. A lot of it's now distributed across the, the environment of the planet. Uh, for us geologists, the important signal is actually microplastics, so less than five millimeters in dimension. These are increasingly becoming deposited through the river systems, into lakes, and into the oceans. They're everywhere. So we can recognize the Anthropocene starting 1950 by looking for microplastics in sediments. Something you may not be aware of is the term spheroidal carbonaceous particles, SCPs. So this is, this is an example here. It's about 50 microns across. It's got a very distinctive pitted texture to it. They're produced solely by high temperature burning of coal and fuel oil, uh, mainly from power stations. And a typical power station will emit about 25 trillion of these particles per day. So huge numbers. They're emitted in the, the smokestacks of the power stations and go into the atmosphere and distribute over great areas. In fact, part of our recent studies have found some of these particles in Antarctic ice for the very first time. So it shows you they can transfer over thousands of kilometers. Unlike the previous figures, which were production figures, these are actually uh, work which was carried out by another member of the working group, Neil Rose, looking at the presence, the, the percentages of these uh, particles in lake sediments across the planet. So it's 76 locations in different parts of the world. What he found was the first of these particles comes in around about 1830, 1840 in the UK uh, and Western Europe, where the Industrial Revolution starts. Increasingly, you find other parts of the world show evidence of these particles but they're in small numbers compared with what happens again with the Great Acceleration where the, the abundance increases very dramatically. You tend to find that there's then a peak in the number of particles uh, in Western Europe and North America in about the 1970s. In Asia and Southern Hemisphere, it's more likely the 1990s. And then you see the, 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 the concentrations falling off. This is in, introducing an idea that 
we don't say that all of these signals that we have represent uh, the entirety of the Anthropocene's history in the future. They can be simply just recording the very beginning of the Anthropocene. They're a useful tool for us to, to recognize that an onset of upturn like this represents the base of the Anthropocene, but they may not persist much more than for the next few decades. So looking at sedimentary systems, things like a city, you can imagine this is actually being a sedimentary system. Uh, one of the things we did was to uh, try and estimate how big was what we call the technosphere. You know, what is the scale of the, the materials that we have generated? Uh, and for the entire planet, this is a paper that was uh, published, led by uh, Jan Zalezevich, who, who was the chair of the working group in 2017. We estimated that there's 27 trillion tons of human modified materials on the planet. That comes in places like urban areas like this, but it's also the effects we have on uh, uh, churning up the soil with regard to agriculture, uh, development of transport networks, and even reservoirs. So that's a, a sort of scale which represents, if you spread it everywhere across the planet, 27 centimeters thickness of human generated materials across the entire land or the continent uh, areas. This, this work was led by uh, Jai Savitsky uh, from the University of Colorado. And he was, she was looking at uh, the, the scale of change of, of sediment loads between 1950 and 2010. Uh, looking at a number of characteristics, things like soil erosion has tripled in that 60-year interval of time. And though soil erosion has generated more sediment, actually less sediment is getting to the oceans. Uh, so processes like rivers, wind, glaciers are actually transporting less. It's dropped from 22 billion tons to 17 billion tons. In the oceans, trawler fishing is disturbing the top sediment uh, at the, the bottom of the oceans, um, such that it's gone from nearly three billion tons of sediment disturbance to now 22 billion tons. And if you include other factors, which I'll discuss in the next few slides, add them all together, this is a change that's happened in the last 60 years of 70 billion tons, nearly 300 billion tons, so a 300% change in sediment load over 60 years. Some local interest for Brazilians. I'm going to show you this picture of the Itopo Dam. Uh, you know, obviously one of the biggest hydroelectric schemes on the planet. Um, but important to realize that during the last 70 years or so, there has been 58,500 large dams. Not as big as this necessarily, greater than 15 meters high, but the 58,000 of these have been produced in the last 70 years at a rate of two a day. Clearly that has stopped a lot of the sediment getting from the rivers into the oceans. It's all being trapped in the reservoirs here. And we estimate that in a total of 3.2 trillion tons of sediment is no longer getting to the deltas, to getting to the oceans, because they're now accumulating in these reservoirs. If you put all of that material and dumped it on Spain, it would be five meters thickness. Can we quantify the amount of human generated material? And this is a paper that we did uh, trying to quantify this uh, from 1925 through to 2015. The colors here represent um, this sort of bluish color here is all of the mineral and metal production plus the waste and overburden that's extracted and deposited associated with that, that exploitation of the minerals. Um, the, by far and away, the, the largest mineral extracted is coal still, and that's shown here in orange. So that's coal production, but also the wastes that are generated by that industry. The gray represents uh, aggregate and cement, in large part going to make the concrete. The yellow is um, the sort of offshore uh, dredging um, in small amounts there. And then blue are the civil engineering projects, the, the, the projects that make our cities and transport networks. And again, when you total them together, you see this great acceleration curve. So it's almost flat and then suddenly starts increasing from 1950 onwards. Uh, estimate of 10.5 billion tons of materials being generated in 1950. Uh, then 316 billion tons by 2014. 
Uh, that's equivalent to about 150 cubic, cubic kilometers of material generated in one year. Or per person, it's about 43 tons for everybody on the planet. Now, interesting if you then compare that figure with the data I told you about that came from Jai Savitsky about the sort of natural movement of sediments from land to ocean, which, as I said, have decreased over that period of time. So back in 1950, our artificial sediments were about half of the, the mass of the natural processes. And yet, by 2014, we're looking at this being 18 times more artificial material compared with the natural processes. So again, this is giving you the indication that humans are having an overwhelming uh, influence on the, ch the changing of the planet's landscape. Geochemical signals, and there's so many of these that we could pick uh, as part of this study. And I'm just going to select a few examples, things like uh, carbon dioxide and sulfur, which is a product of burning fossil fuels, uh, but also industrial pollution. There's metals here, in part the product of mining and smelting, industrial pollution, but also remember that some of these, things like mercury comes from burning coal, lead from burning gasoline in the past. We have uh, the persistent organic pollutants, uh, things like poly poly polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, a product of industrial pollution. We have uh, radionuclides coming from nuclear testing, and then things like nitrates, methane, and, and also pesticides such as DDT that come from agriculture and deforestation. Now the important thing here is, and I should emphasize throughout this talk, that the Anthropocene does not represent the first human impact. So it's not the onset of the signals, which you, you can see here, can be quite varied in where we recognize these appearing either regionally or globally. What we're saying is the Anthropocene is the overwhelming impact of humans. And so the signals, where they accelerate, where they start to upturn, uh, is where we think the Anthropocene starts. And you can see there's much more consistency here so towards the middle of the 20th century. Many of these signals then peak in the latter part of the 20th century, with the exception of CO2 and methane, which are still rising. And so what we want to do here is uh, identify that in many cases, geochemical signals have peaked and are in some cases recovering um, back to their 1950 levels. But again, what this says is geochemical signals are used as a tool for recognizing the onset of the Anthropocene, but not necessarily the total life of the Anthropocene thousands of years into the future. We may hopefully not see things like radionuclides coming from nuclear tests happening in the future. Now I'm going to just uh, go through just a few examples of these geochemical signals. I mentioned uh, CO2 and methane. This is uh, information that comes from uh, Antarctic ice core, and this record is going back to 20,000 years in this case. And there's a natural variation. It's shown in yellow here uh, of between 170 to 300 parts per million. That variation has been recognized in ice now going back uh, at least 800,000 years. So there's a natural envelope of where we'd expect uh, concentrations of CO2 lower during glacials and slightly higher during the interglacials. And this is the, the Holocene here. But what we're looking at here is the effect of the Anthropocene. So we're no longer in this natural envelope. We've actually increased uh, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere by 140 parts per million. And that's a rate that's 100 times faster than occurred at the end of the last ice age. So these rates of change are phenomenal compared with natural processes. And the amount of CO2 levels we have at present were last seen on the planet three million years ago when temperatures were about two to three degrees warmer sea level about 10 to 20 meters higher. So what it looks like is that the processes of changing the, the greenhouse gas composition of the atmosphere is so rapid that the, the planet has not re-equilibrated re yet. And so what we're seeing is perhaps this is our future when eventually the planet does equilibrate. And then if you look at methane, uh, again, we have a natural envelope of concentrations of methane of between 350 and 800 parts per billion over the last 800,000 years. And again, during the Anthropocene, there's this huge increase in the amount uh, of methane. It's 100, uh, well, so 1,100 uh, parts per billion rise. 
uh, and that's 150% above pre-industrial levels. Now, if I was to ask you where would you place uh, an epoch boundary on this curve, well, already geologists say that's an epoch boundary there at the end of the last ice age. And they also say that these are age boundaries. Note that there's practically no change to CO2 concentrations and methane concentrations at these age boundaries. Some people say we should say that the Anthropocene is like this. Well, it isn't. It clearly, it's of scales comparable, if not greater, to the start of the Holocene epoch. If we look at the nitrogen cycle, one of the, the fundamental changes that we've seen in the last century is shown by the red curve here. Again, it's a great acceleration curve, and it's to do with the artificial uh, nitrogen compounds that are produced for fertilizers. Uh, it's a product of the Harbour Bosch process that was invented in 1913. And uh, here we're talking about 90 million tonnes of these fertilizers being produced per year. Then there's here this dashed curve represents the nitrogen oxides coming from combustion engines. Again, adding reactive nitrogen to the environment. Combine those together and then look at signals in, in this case, Arctic ice core uh, from Greenland. Uh, and you can see it's very, very flexible, very variable, uh, spiky signal, but again, at 1950, there's a significant upturn in concentrations, a doubling of reactive nitrogen uh, present at the Earth's surface. And there's a comparable change also in phosphorus happening at the same time, phosphorus-based fertilizers uh, being important. And it's been estimated that the, the coastal zones of the planet now receive about 100 million tons per year of these anthropogenically sourced reactive nitrogens. That leads to uh, eutrophication of uh, the oceans, uh, local development of seasonal dead zones. So we're losing, losing animals along both coastal zones and also in lakes because of this uh, hypoxic or anoxic condition as a result of the excess uh, nitrogen in the environment. And then uh, radionuclides. This, this actually is, is probably... The, the most robust marker for the onset of the Anthropocene, but it's the one that has least impact on the planet in that the Earth systems are not modified by the emissions coming from nuclear weapons. So the very first testing happens in 1945. The black columns here represent the number of, of tests, um, but the, if you also look at the magnitude of the, the detonation yields, they are quite low through to about 1952. What happens in 52, in fact, on the 1st of November 1952, is the detonation of this, which is the Ivy Mike test uh, in the Pacific Ocean. It's the first thermonuclear device, the H-bomb. And that has uh, a much greater detonation yield than traditional nuclear weapons. And it, it essentially caused radioactive fallout to go from being localized uh, continent scale through to, to global in its distribution. And we have uh, signals such as, in green here, radiocarbon. Uh, it starts to show an increase uh, around about 1955, peaking in 1963, and then gradually tailing off as concentrations go back to where they are about 1945. Only in the last few years have we got back to this level again. What's more responsive, this, this, by the way, radiocarbon is a naturally occurring uh, isotope as well, whereas plutonium is very, very rare in the environment. And so most of the plutonium we're seeing is coming from the fallout from these nuclear tests. And see how the blue curve responds immediately to the first detonations of these thermonuclear devices. So there's a very rapid rise. There's actually a drop, and it's a two-year interval, which is a moratorium of testing. Um, where the tests uh, just didn't happen for a couple of years. And you can see plutonium levels start falling. And then there's a very pronounced uh, set of testing in 1962 that causes this peak. And then there's something called the Limited Test Ban Treaty in 1963 that meant that most of the detonations then went underground. So we no longer created that fallout signal. And as a result, the plutonium levels dropped very quickly. So what we're suggesting is if you want a pra pragmatic and practical placed to define the base of the Anthropocene, then look for this upturn of the plutonium. Climate change. Now, this has been one of the, the key aspects of discussion related to the Anthropocene, and yet climate change is one of the harder things to use uh, 
to define the Anthropocene. And I'd show, again, over the last 20,000 years, this is temperature anomalies. Uh, as you go from the, the last ice age, you have a sort of three, three and a half degree centigrade rise happening slowly over about a six to 8,000 year interval. Peak temperatures in the Holocene are about 7,000 years ago. And since then, there's been this very slow decrease in temperature uh, as we move towards the sort of little ice age that we've had in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but generally, a fairly stable temperature profile until you get to here. Uh, that, that point is actually around about 1850, when you suddenly see a reversal in trend. What should happen naturally is that this would keep on falling, 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 until we get into the next uh, glaciation. But we, we have reversed the, the, the temperature trends. And in more detail, from 1850 through to the present day, uh, we can see that there's been this rather dramatic change from about 1975 onwards of this inflection of temperature rising about one degree centigrade. The reason why climate change has been difficult for us to use as a, a marker for the Anthropocene is the fact that around about 1940 to 1970, the temperatures were fairly constant. Uh, and to some part, that may relate to just the huge volumes of pollution that was happening at the time. So particles and things like sulfur dioxide emissions, in effect, stopped um, solar in, 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 um, so, uh, the, the effects of the sun heating the atmosphere, uh, solar insulation, uh, in effect, steadied for several years. And it's only now, since we've actually started to improve the environment, that you start to see the temperatures increasing. So, what I'm saying here is 7,000 years, we've had a gradual fall of temperature. Then we've had this one degree centigrade rise since 1975. That rate of rise at 0.02 degrees centigrade is order of a magnitude faster than happened here at the start of the Holocene, though the scale of rise is not as big as we saw then at yet. It, it still can be in the future, of course. Um, and then the, the final point to make on this is that it's believed now that the temperatures we're seeing today actually exceed the peak that we saw in the Holocene, and it probably represents the warmest the planet's been for the last 125,000 years, when sea levels were about five to nine degrees higher. So again, is this our future scenario? And so sea levels, uh, this is recorded data sets going back to 1860, showing that sea levels have risen globally at a, an average of 0.25 meters, which doesn't sound very much. The rate of rise uh, over the last century is about 1.7 millimeters per year. Uh, it has increased to a rate of about 3.7 millimeters per year over the last decade. Um, but notice that there's no great acceleration here. Sea level has a lag to it. So there is rising temperature since 1975, but there's a delay in that signal being then seen as evidence of sea level rise. So what I would say here is the great acceleration is still to come in the case of sea level. And uh, the last of the signals I want to talk about uh, are biological change in the Anthropocene. I use this photograph, it's from, from my garden in the UK, and it shows, uh, the reason why I'm using this is it's got Virginia creeper, which is a native of eastern USA, and Nephophia, which is a native of South Africa, both occurring in a garden in England. Geologically, that is impossible. It's only been something that's happened over the last uh, very short period of time that we've had a position where such species can be transported around the planet on such a great scale. Uh, a, a good example of translocations, or a bad example, I suppose, is, is the way that container ships uh, over the last few decades take in the ballast water um, materials from, and, and organisms from one location, say from somewhere in Eastern, Europe, Eastern Asia, and transport it around the planet, uh, releasing those ballast waters at ports all around the planet and I guess including in Rio. Uh, and so this, this piece of work was recognizing that the number of introduced marine species, invasive species, are greater than 250 or so in the Mediterranean. San Francisco Bay, which is one of the areas that we've worked on in particular, about 99% of the biomass in San Francisco Bay are invasive species that have been introduced uh, mostly since the 1970s. Mammal extinctions has been something that's been raised as evidence of human impact in the past. And it's true that it seems that 
some of the some iconic megafauna, uh, mammals, so, uh, have, have become extinct at the first time that humans have moved into an area. So 50,000 years ago, uh, people migrating into Australasia caused extinctions on quite large scale. Uh, in the Americas, from about 15,000 years ago, uh, significant extinctions. These are represented in, in this figure as being the number of extinctions per million species per year. So it's a way of trying to uh, average out the, the data. What it shows is that, yes, these were significant compared with natural background extinction rates. But what's more important are things like the, ex the extinctions we're seeing a thousand years ago with extinctions on islands such as Madagascar, New Zealand, uh, and Polynesia. Uh, those are much greater rates of extinction, admittedly more endemic species, not the iconic species we're talking about like these. Um, the Columbian, Columbian ex exchange that we had 500 years ago between the old world and the new world has figures here, still very much lower than the rates of extinction that we're seeing during the Anthropocene. But probably more significant at this stage is not the extinction, not the loss of species, it's the reduction in populations of species. Uh, and this is work carried out by the WWF, the Zoological Society of London, it's the Living Planet Report. It's the uh, populations of vertebrate species, which they reckon has decreased by 69% across the planet. That's 5,000 or more species that have been studied between 1970 and 2018. In fact, in South America and the Caribbean, their estimates are actually more like 94% decrease in populations between 1970 and 2018. So we're losing not necessarily lots of species, but certainly the populations of species are, are crashing. Then there's the domesticated species, uh, you know, things like uh, pigs, cattle, etc. The, they have suddenly become a very major component of the biomass of the planet. So this is estimates of um, the wild, uh, wild land mammals uh, mass is about 3 million tonnes of carbon. It's about 2% of the total amount of mammals, biomass. A third of it is humans, two thirds of it is the livestock, and only a small component is, is wildlife. Uh, that represents a significant decrease compared with 100,000 years ago, but interestingly, the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus that we're adding to the, to the environment has allowed the total biomass to actually increase fourfold. It's just that we've created these, the environments ideal for us and for our domesticated species. Now, in geology, we often mark uh, the start of a, a geological time interval by recognition of the first appearance of a particular species, a fossil. Um, it's difficult to do that for the Anthropocene because the evolution rates that we see are, are slow compared with the length of the Anthropocene. But there may be certain circumstances where you could see human-induced evolution being evident at around about 1950. Uh, and so the example we're using here is that change from the red jungle fowl to the broiler chicken. They're the same species, um, but in the last 70 years, the, the, the size of the bones has doubled and the mass of the bodies has increased fivefold in that short duration of time. And it's a, it's a significant market in that there are 66 billion chickens slaughtered per year, which is three times the biomass of all wild birds on the planet. So, these are very common and so could represent a marker, a biological marker, uh, to future paleontologists of the start of the Anthropocene. Now, briefly, I want to just say uh, something about the process that we're going through at present in defining the Anthropocene. We have a protocol we have to follow. It's something that's forced upon us by the governing body, which is the International Commission on Stratigraphy. We have to define something called a Global Boundary Stratotype Section and Point. GSSP, commonly known as the golden spike. It's essentially a point which you place in a reference section which represents the base of the geological time interval you're interested in. And there's a number of things you, you need to uh, follow as part of this process. So that uh, GSSP must contain a stratigraphic marker that defines the lower boundary and allows correlation globally. It must be defined by an observable change in the physical properties or fossil content of the strata, and ideally you want it to be datable. It must have adequate thickness to support global correlation. 
It must be continuous without any changes. So essentially, we can't afford to have gaps where we don't know what's happening. It should be unaffected by tectonic and sedimentary movements. It must be accessible. This is important. It must be accessible for research and free to access. So you can, you can replicate the work that's been carried out. And it should contain as many specific mark horizons or other attributes as possible, favorable for long distance correlation away from the, the reference section. Now, since 2009, we've been in the process of analyzing uh, a number of sites across the planet. This was done in collaboration uh, with the House of World Cultures, which is Germany's national center for the presentation and discussion of international contemporary arts. These are not scientists, but they saw the value of the work we were doing and helped fund uh, Bearing in mind the working group has no budget whatsoever, we had no way of, of being able to carry out the work to try and find such a reference point. They have provided that funding and allowed us to go out to communities across the planet and say, do you have a site that could be relevant to defining the Anthropocene? 12 sites came forward, these are them shown here, uh, across five continents, none, I'm afraid to say, in South America or Africa. Um, but of the sites, they occur across eight different environments, so anoxic basins, estuaries, coastal areas, corals, lakes, peat, ice sheet, cave deposits, and anthropogenic deposits. Just going to give you one example, because we haven't got time to do any more than that, but this is Sihai Longguan in China, close to the Korean border there, and it's in a lake. It's a, a beautiful volcanic crater lake. They chose this because there's no streams flowing into it, so any of the signals you see in the water, in the sediment that's accumulated, has come from the atmosphere. And what they do is they drill a core into the sediments at the bottom of the lake, and this is the core itself. And importantly, you can see this little banding in here. These represent annual growths of sediment. They're called valves. Uh, and you can count these back. So it's like a, a tree ring in dendrochronology. So you can date the succession very accurately. And what they recognized was a change in the color of the sediment. So here, these yellowish colors are clays which were deposited in an oxic environment. 1950 sees a transition to where you start to see these darker bands appearing. Uh, and eventually, by 1970, the whole succession is very dark, sulfide rich. This relates to anoxia happening uh, within the lake itself. But importantly, there's a whole host of geochemical and biological signals that happen at 1953, which is the point that they would say represents the start of the Anthropocene. So plutonium levels increase very dramatically. Um, iodine isotopes increase, more to do actually with um, reprocessing plants for plutonium rather than actual detonation of nuclear weapons. There's increases in, in soot and these steroidal carbonaceous particles due to burning of fossil fuels, polyaromatic hydrogen, hydrocarbons coming from burning of, of biomass, uh, lead, Probably the increases you're seeing here relate to gasoline uh, use. Uh, and then finally, this last one, phytoplankton, shows a very dramatic decrease in abundance uh, starting around about 1950. So it's the combination of all of these things together show you the, the significant change that happens to this one location at one particular time, 1953. But interestingly, then, when you, you compare all 12 sites together, uh, what we've done here is show the onset of a signal at the base, and the peak of the signal here at the top. But as I've said previously, it's not the onset that's important. It's actually the big change, the rapid change that happens. It's marked by these signals in here. I've done it before, the steroidal carbonaceous particles, plutonium, radiocarbon, nitrogen isotopes. And you can see there's a degree of consistency across all 12 sites. I'll just put a line in there, that's 1950. And you can see the consistency and where these big changes all happen. Lastly, the future of the Anthropocene. And uh, perversely, what I suggest we do is look at the past to see what happened in an equivalent situation 56 million years ago. It's something called the Paleocene, Eocene, Thermal Maximum. So a naturally occurring sudden increase in temperatures shown by the red curve here of about three degrees centigrade. It mirrors a huge change in emissions of carbon. So these carbon isotopes also show a, an increase at this point here. And there's also acidification of the oceans shown by this blue curve that drops at this point. Now the patterns it is, is relevant here because it's something that's consistent in many examples in geological past that you have initially what's called here a pre-onset excursion. 
So for about 10,000 years, you start to see the evidence of change happening, but then the onset is very dramatic. About 3,000 years, you suddenly get this big upturn. It then gets to a point where things stabilize, then you have a peak that continues as a plateau, in this case for about 100,000 years, then the planet uh, starts to recover, and so the signals start dropping down back to where they were prior to this emission event. But what we're not saying is that this is the same as this, because once you start looking at the biology of the planet, this major temperature rise here caused significant change to the biology of the planet. So on land, there was significant floral changes, changes to vertebrates. Um, there was a, an acme of this dinoflagellate species happening starting at the same time, but also an extinction event in benthic foraminifera with about 30 to 50% species loss. All of these happen pretty much exactly the same time as the big upturn in temperatures. And it was for this reason that they, they placed uh, a boundary in geological time between the Paleocene here and the, and the Eocene. What I suggest is that this little bit here, the pre-onset excursion, is our industrial revolution. It's the time where things start happening uh, on small scale. We are now in the onset phase. We're somewhere probably about here and not knowing where the trajectory is for future change. And it could, in theory, go up to this point. And then we'll have a, a period of equilibration with climate change, uh, environmental change, which persists for period of time and then eventually will recover but never recover to what it was in the Holocene because the biology of the planet will be so fundamentally changed. So we can see this um, again comparing atmospheric carbon dioxide and global temperatures. We've seen this curve before so we're going from the ice age through into the Holocene. The stability that we see during the Holocene has been changed radically by the CO2 emissions that we are, we're seeing at present, and also the, the temperature changes. Now, in worst case scenario, these are scenarios of different types of future emissions, we could have something that's very comparable to the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum. So similar temperature rises of three or four degrees. In the best case scenario, we're still looking at both CO2 levels and temperatures, which are at a plateau, very much elevated compared with the Holocene. So we're saying here, this is a different Earth state. The Anthropocene is not the same as the Holocene. How long will this last? This is showing here 10,000 years. So the duration of the Holocene repeated as, a, as an Anthropocene. But there's many lines of evidence to say that the amount of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere at present has essentially caused the next glaciation to be delayed by at least 50,000 years if we add a, a little bit more CO2 into the atmosphere, then it could be as much as 100,000 years. So that would make the Holocene as being the, the, uh, the blip in the geology of the planet. The Anthropocene is the thing that's probably going to persist. And, and clearly, as I mentioned before, it's the biology of the planet that represents the permanent changes. And uh, it, at present, the amount of vertebrate extinctions is quite small. It's about 617 extinctions since 1500. Represented here as the black uh, numbers, it's generally 1-2% to of, of species loss. But that's talking about known losses of species. The red here is, is the IUCN threatened species. It's the, the red list. Uh, in effect, these are where species are present in small numbers, uh, probably in very isolated populations in conservation areas. Geologically, the chances of finding these in future sediments are negligible. So you might as well say that the, the true figure for what's the extinction rate is more like these, so you know, 10, 20, 30, 40%. If we get to a point where it's 70%, then we're in a mass extinction. It would be the sixth mass extinction in the last half billion years. And I think if we, if we see that happening, then the Anthropocene shouldn't be an epoch, it should be something of higher magnitude than that. So, to summarise, over the last 11,000 years, strata shows an increasing but gradual human modification of landscapes, geochemical signals and biodiversity. This is all consistent with our idea of the, the Holocene. But then there's been a sub substantial, approximately globally synchronous change to the Earth system, which has intensified dramatically in the mid-20th century during the Great Acceleration. This is when we think the Anthropocene starts. <laughs>
Many anthropogenic geochemical signals are short duration. In effect, our rapid detection of these signals has resulted to effective mitigation. So such spikes are very useful markers of the 20th century onset of the Anthropocene. But then other geochemical and climatic changes will prove of long duration, whereas biotic change is effectively permanent and will characterize the future expression of the Anthropocene. So I thank you very much. Time for a few questions if you have. Marcelo. Right. Uh, so, so it was, was really incredible, I mean, amazing talk, and, and it, it, it's a wonderful and fascinating story. If we are in a very bad mood and we think that things are going downhill, your last sentence mentioned that in that case, Anthropocene would not be an epoch. Maybe. So the quaternary is associated with the presence of ice in both Perfect. poles. Yeah. So if we lose the ice in both poles, then that's the, the end of Anthropocene yeah. couldn't be inside yeah. the quaternary yeah. anymore. So, so what we've done in effect is try to place the, the, the magnitude of change to an epoch level, comparing it with what's happened in the Holocene and the Pleistocene. Uh, if we get much greater rates of change, then there's every reason to say that we upgrade to a higher rank um, the Anthropocene to being a period. If you lose 75% of species on the planet, then perhaps we should even say era level. But, but, that's, even, that's but, the but even the Holocene would somehow disappear, right? It, it, if, you, if you look at the future scenario of maybe a million years into the future, and we perhaps still see the Anthropocene as a continuation. Even, even if we become extinct, the impact that we've created is a permanent one. Um, then increasing the Holocene becomes a much smaller component. It's, it's you know, 10,000 years now. It stays 10,000 years, but the, the Anthropocene expands into the future. Thank you so much. Okay. Even though <laughs> I feel like I'm going really very fast downhill. And, but there, there is a point that I would like to comment. It's fantastic, all the data that you brought us. But the effect, it's going to be globally. But there is a huge difference among who is performing. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, that's yeah. something also that yeah. we need to comment, for instance, that, most a, of countries yeah. in Latin America and yeah. the Caribbean, as well as Africa, yeah. are not doing, yeah. the, so, are, are not really yeah. part so good yeah. or so bad of this era. What, so I thank you so much for this. Yeah. It's, a, it's a fair point to make. What obviously we do is look at the, the story that geology tells you. It's, it's what the impact of human, humans are to the planet. It doesn't necessarily discriminate who caused that and, and what processes necessarily as well. Um, but I suppose the, the key thing here is the Anthropocene, if it's 1950 onwards, does become much more of a global influence. Initially, Paul Crutzen said, start of the Industrial Revolution was the start of the Anthropocene. We looked at that and started to realize that we're talking here about Western Europe, the UK. It had no impact at all in South America, most of Asia. He couldn't see any evidence for that. And, and we kept looking at the data and saying, it pushes back when change happens to 1950. By that point, all, all the continents are starting to become industrialized. And so the signals become common between the different places. Now, it doesn't say that everybody on average contributes the same. It just says that as a planetary response, this is what we see. Olá. Bem, vamos primeiro traduzir para a língua portuguesa aqui. Tudo bem? Só um minutinho. 
Prontinho? Vamos nessa. Bem, primeiro eu quero parabenizar pela sua fala, foi incrível. E eu quero muito também aproveitar essa oportunidade. Eu sou educador aqui no Museu da Manhã, trabalho aqui com o público né, e atendimento. E eu sei que essa temática é de extrema relevância, principalmente para as pessoas que visitam. Nós somos aqui de um museu de ciência e nós temos uma parte aqui na exposição principal que é sobre o antropoceno. Né? Então, a minha pergunta é mais como que uma dica, né, eu te peço, por sua experiência, porque você pesquisa, apresenta os dados né, de maneira maravilhosa aqui para a gente. Mas eu queria é, uma dica de, de como que a gente consegue é, trabalhar essas questões é, do antropoceno que são de urgência. Né? É para, sim, alarmar as, as pessoas, para que a gente tenha, sim, é, é claro, uma ação. Então, como que você daria uma dica, né? você como um comunicador e também para mim, é, para eu poder passar para esse público, essas milhões de pessoas que visitam aqui? Né? Porque, assim, vocês estão preparados para essa mudança? É sempre uma frase que eu, que eu passo para as pessoas tentando dar essa consciência, né? porque o, em instância governamental a gente sabe que existem as problemáticas, que existem as questões, mas e aí? Quando que isso vai ter uma mudança, uma ação, sabe? Eu acho que eu te peço aqui um apoio mesmo, uma frase, né? para a gente motivar essas pessoas a ter essa urgência também. Obrigada. Obrigada. Eu acho que o meu comentário é que a mensagem é que, sim, nós sabemos que os humanos têm impactado the planet ever since we evolved. Um, but what we're saying through this is that the significant change, the overwhelming change, is something that happened a generation ago, two generations ago. I am part of the reason for the Anthropocene, and I, I take ownership of it. Um, but what's important is that, that technologically, we are so advanced now that we, we can monitor that change almost in real time. We know what effect we're having on the planet, It's now our decision what scale that will be. That's never been the truth in the past. You know, we, almost we said nature was so big that humans couldn't impact. And yet now that we know that's not true, and we can quantify how much change we're having. And I showed examples where it was realized, things like the radiogenic fallout from, from nuclear testing. Once it was realized that that was a very harmful thing, testing, using the planet as a laboratory to test detonation of nuclear weapons, We, we were able to say, well, we're stopping that. So politicians came in and stopped the whole process, and we reversed it very quickly. So, you know, we can cause things very, very rapidly to change detrimentally, but we can do it the opposite way as well. Uh, and we have the information to do that, and that's a positive thing to have, to say we can make the reverse changes. But unfortunately, how do you re-engineer things like the translocation of species across the planet? You know, we can't say now, all those things that came from Europe they all go back to Europe and we keep South America as endemic species. You can't do that. And when you lose a species, at present, we can only say it's permanently lost. It may be in the future we can re-engineer species to reappear after they become extinct, but we can't do that yet. So, um, you know, if you could treat this, the issue as being uh, assumed that what we're doing becomes a permanent change, you then realize that the future geology of the planet is a really an indicator of what we as a species have done. It's a permanent legacy. Um, do we want to be ashamed of that change or do we want to celebrate what good we did? So. <laughs> so, since we You don't have any further questions, so let's thanks thank again, Dr. Colling, for coming.